Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we are looking at English literature from 1590 to 1798 and we will be considering the works of Oliver Goldsmith in a detailed introduction. I am Anna Kurian and I teach in the Department of English at the University of Hyderabad. Initially, we shall be thinking about Oliver Goldsmith as both an author and a poet who wrote in a variety of genres and forms during his lifetime. We will be paying some attention to some of his poetry, to his novella and of course to his most famous play, She Stoops to Conquer. It was first performed in 1773 and it continues to have value even today because of its humour and because of its representative quality. There is also a quality to its writing which is unmistakable and which continues to enthrall viewers as well as readers today. The original title was Mistakes of a Night because all the action takes place within one night in one space itself. And so, it, therefore then we can realize that it observes the unity of both time as well as place. We begin with the life and letters of Goldsmith. Now, there is not too much evidence as to Goldsmith's life. So, we know that he was of Irish stock and that he was born in November in 1728. And he was the son of an Anglican clergyman. But what becomes significant about his life is not so much his origins as to the company that he kept later on. This comes to us much later after he finishes his education at a school and later on in Trinity College in Dublin and going on from there to study medicine. So when we talk about Goldsmith the author, we are also talking about somebody who was a medical doctor and who went around Europe begging for bread by playing the flute and by practicing medicine. He also had this brief time when he was supposed to have come to India as part of the East India Company as a medical doctor, but this was, this did not happen because of certain problems in his life as well as in historical reasons. Then, the fact that he went through Europe without a stable income helped him to understand poverty and much of this understanding of poverty and understanding of life without money is visible in the works that he wrote for literature. Now his letters have been edited and reprinted and they give us a much clearer picture of him. In that we see in his letters we see that the kind of person that he was especially his letters to his sister to his brothers to his friends in all of those we see his personality emerge and it is a personality which is kind of complex because he was somebody who was extremely insecure in one sense and so he wanted attention, he sought attention all the time and he was frequently unhappy and yet at the same time you see the sustaining and sustained affection that he had for his friends as well as for his family members and that sustained affection is something that earns him a place in the affections of a number of people including some of the great people of English literature such as Walpole and Johnson, Dr. Johnson himself, whom he counts amongst his closest friends. Now, Dr. Johnson often teased him, mocked him. He himself often fought with Dr. Johnson, but they always made up later and became good friends. Dr. Johnson is also supposed to have re re uh, rescued him from one of his financial troubles because he sent a note to Dr. Johnson telling him that he was about to get into really deep trouble and his landlady was about to have him arrested because he couldn't pay the rent. Dr. Johnson goes to his aid, gives him money and then later on finds him to have written something which Dr. Johnson gets published, sells for 60 pounds and with those, with that money Goldsmith is then able to rehabilitate himself. We begin now with a series of Chinese letters that Goldsmith published which is today known as Citizen of the World. Now, Citizen of the World used to be a favorite component of many literature syllabi across the world and it, they are interesting because in that he invented a fictional Chinese character called Lin Chi Altangi who is from the province of Hunan in China and he then comes to England and he speaks to us about how England is, how the Englishmen are and he gives us a foreigner's perspective on Englishmen and England and tells us about the culture, the civilization, the habits, the people of England and how they behave and how what they are like and all of this is supposed to be from the perspective of an outsider. Now this is a fictional device which has been used by several others during this period as well including Montesquieu and Horace Walpole but it is 
goldsmith via the citizen of the world who makes this a successful enterprise and this is so also because the character of Altangi writes funny letters. He does not write these boring and extremely descriptive of course, but boring letters which are full of seriousness. Instead he writes letters which are humorous. He sees things which he considers ridiculous and he writes about them in a manner which then causes amusement to the English people itself. Now these letters were originally published in the public lecture and later on they were published in a collected volume as Citizen of the World. Apart from the citizen of the world, Goldsmith is also famous for something called The Traveller or A Prospect of Society, a long narrative poem published in 1764. Though of course its composition was begin, begun far earlier when he was travelling in Europe on a shoestring budget. Now the narrator of the poem, the speaker of the poem speculates on happiness and this is something which actually people like us should find interesting with our emphasis on always being happy. And countries such as Bhutan which have a happiness index and talk about gross domestic happiness rather as an index of their prosperity, their lifestyle and so on and so forth. So in today's world where happiness is central to the idea of how we imagine ourselves, here you have Goldsmith who in the late 18th century is writing about how happiness is perceived by different cultures. And in a philosophical poem written in heroic couplet, he talks about the causes of human happiness and human sorrow. Goldsmith also has an interesting way of thinking about happiness because he says that there is happiness in every culture, every civilization, every nation in the world, except that nations perceive happiness differently. And because they perceive happiness differently, we cannot therefore understand another nation's quality of happiness. Therefore then, because it is manifested in a different way. So the Indian version of happiness might depend upon certain things, whereas the, say the British or the American version of happiness might depend upon certain other things. And happiness therefore is exclusive to a community or a nation. But eventually he comes to the conclusion that happiness is to be found only within oneself. So every individual is responsible for his or her own happiness. The poem of course has received considerable praise and is usually praised both for its imagery and for the sublime notions of and the philosophical ideas that it embodies. Now we come to what I would consider one of the central texts of Oliver Goldsmith's canon and oeuvre The Deserted well Village published in 1770 and it is like The Traveller a work of social commentary. The Deserted Village shows us the picture of a village which has been emptied out. So you have a village which initially of course is seen to be bustling, which is seen to be beautiful and so on and so forth, full of people, full of life, full of activities and so on and so forth. And then as the poem progresses, you see that village being emptied out of its people. You also see those people moving to either the Americas or to the cities in London, in England itself and the consequences of that movement upon their lives. So. Goldsmith then has this large canvas upon which to sketch the problems of life in village life in England as well as what happens to innocent villagers if they move out from their village and go into either urban centres or if they move to America. Now he in the uh, uh, deserted village criticises a lot of things. He begins of course with consumerism but moves on to capitalism and then he talks about the effects of the industrial revolution which impoverish people as in they, impover they might have prosperity in terms of materials but they will be impoverished in terms of the quality of their life. Then he talks about the enclosure of the common lands in rural parts, the work for landscape gardening as opposed to leaving a landscape in its original state and this is again something which has an echo in today's world where often large swaths of land are cleared because in, in their place there will be plantations of trees. So we do not leave a landscape in its original state which will have shrubs and plants which are natural to that place. Instead we clear it up and in its place we will then have a landscape garden which has been created by somebody with a certain plan, a certain blueprint in mind. So he criticizes that. 
and in general he criticizes everything the money mindedness of the ordinary people the commercial instincts which rule their lives their desire for urban prosperity which then causes them to leave the village and in the process he then extols and exalts village life and village values at the expense of the city the poem of course belongs in the pastoral tradition which exalts country life as opposed to city life it imitates classical writers such as juvenal and so on and so forth but it is also significant like thomas gray's poem about eligibility in the country church it is significant because it talks about how the rural poor should remain in their rural surroundings rather than aim at a more prosperous city life so in one sense it's also about knowing your station and keeping to your station in life if you're poor and you're living in a village please enjoy the beauty of the village do not try to go into the city and become richer happier more prosperous so goldsmith then is attacking also the commercial instincts or the money minded instincts which a lot of us are prone to and the positive values in the poem are are, are all aligned with the people who live in the village so these are people who then prioritize nature over culture and over art they live lives of frugality and they live lives of great physical labor and vigor as opposed to the corruption which is visible in the city it also of course posits the people who live in the countryside as more virtuous and good as opposed to those who move into the city or they move to america and there of course they are all corrupted and become evil and wicked and lose their innocence now we move on to looking at the two major comedies that goldsmith wrote and they are the critic and she stoops to conquer out of which she stoops to conquer is a text for the day and it is one of the most popular and most studied plays of the time now if we are to have a good understanding of she stoops to conquer we also need to then understand the distinction between restoration comedy sentimental comedy and anti sentimental comedy she stoops to conquer is an example of the last named it's an anti sentimental comedy now restoration comedy as we have studied when we did uh which at least country wife is comedy which is full of dissolute men and women who are corrupt and not virtuous at all they are amoral immoral also they have no understanding of the nobility of marriage or family or the sacrosanct nature of an institution such as marriage and they have very loose morals if you want to put it that way now restoration comedy also featured characters such as horner in the country wife whose only ambition in life is to sleep with as many women as possible never mind if they are married about to be married if they are widowed it does not matter it's only numbers that count and this is what their life is like so it restoration comedy is then a comedy which does not have a moral purpose and it is it gives us a portrayal of seduced wives cuckolded husbands and of course the cuckolder or the adulterer himself who goes around were doing this as his life's work so to speak now sentimental comedy was a reaction to this type of comedy and it instead gave importance to things like feeling and sincerity and ethical values now we might think that feeling sincerity and ethical values are all very well and necessary but the way in which sentimental comedy worked was also that it was full of tears and affecting scenes and sentimentality now to understand sentimentality and the sentimental comedy it is also necessary to understand what sentiment meant to the people of the time now sentimental comedy also had a didactic element it was moral science in one sense and the effect of the comedy is to influence the viewers to then have a better life a more moral life so they work through emotion sentiment morality and a lot of sermonizing and a lot of weeping and crying so everybody was preaching at everybody else and the effect of all that preaching was to make us all improve our lifestyle now sentiment was not during this period seen as just plain emotion it was also seen as something called quickness of perception and this is a description or a definition of sentiment which was provided by dr johnson himself that it's about quickness of perception that you are easily able to see and affected by what you see as well so books like stern's sentimental man and so on and so forth are also then examples of this kind of sentimental writing as also the plays of steel chiver chiver and johnson 
Now, when we look at all of these things, what we are being asked to do is react against the restoration comedy, which was, as we said, dissolute and immoral, and instead in its place, a more middle class type of comedy, which was sternly resolute and sternly moral. It was also a reflection of the way in which people were thought of, that people are inherently good, that they are not evil and wicked like the ones portrayed in restoration comedy, but that they are inherently good, malice, wickedness, the kind of behavior which the rakes and rules of restoration comedy had, that kind of misanthropy is not really natural to man. What is natural to man is goodness. So, sentimental comedy then has a pattern which is fairly recognizable, easy to spot. It has pathos, an overdose of morality and it has lots and lots of tears and emotional denouements where everybody gets worked up and they all start crying all over the place and there is very little laughter. It had serious subjects and it treated them sympathetically and of course everything ends in happiness which was the definition of a comedy during that time. The principal characters all have noble minds, tender minds and they do not have the kinds of witticisms, puns, language, word play which was visible in earlier versions such as the restoration comedy. It was supposed to elevate human minds. So, the audience also after watching a sentimental comedy was supposed to go from there feeling more noble in themselves. And the pleasure that they got from seeing this was a pleasure which everybody gets from watching virtue triumph over vice. And flippancy and this kind of very easy random attitude was to be avoided. And there is to be more emotionalism and sentiment and morality then there was to be humor and wit. So, wit and humor is no longer a characteristic of the sentimental comedy like it was in the restoration comedy. Instead, you have the emphasis on domestic virtues. So, there is love, courtship leading to marriage with a capital M and there will be no scenes of seduction, adultery and so on and so forth. Gross, dissolute sexual freedom is to be strictly avoided. Now, all of these happened and they happened as a reaction to restoration comedy. But then there is also the, rest, the reaction to the sentimental comedy and that is seen in principally in two plays. One is of course Goldsmith's She Stoops to Conquer, the other one is Sheridan's The Rivals where we see then that instead of so much seriousness and so much sermonizing and moralizing, you have all the True qualities of morality, yes, but you do not have it with an overdose of sentimentality and crying and preaching and instead we see good triumphing over evil but with a strong sense of humor. And therefore then this is how we see the progression from restoration comedy via sentimental comedy to the anti-sentimental comedy. And something like She Stoops to Conquer is an example of the anti-sentimental comedy rather than sentimental comedy. Now, Usually said that Goldsmith along with Sheridan was responsible for the anti-sentimental comic drama and this was an effort to balance the emotional excess of the sentimental drama where everybody was crying all over the place and where sentiment was seen as refined sensibility, tender emotions, reflectiveness and meditative calm. Now actually the sentimental comedy does not portray meditative calm, it instead portrays a lot of angst and a lot of weeping. Now, in sentimental comedies, you also had embodiments of virtues, stock characters such as Sir Oliver in The Rivals who is an embodiment of benevolence and so on and so forth. So, the general tendency is to avoid a lot of hearty laughter and instead to keep it fairly serious. But there will still be some humor and there will not be the kind of moral excess that was seen in earlier versions. We move on now to look at the plot of the sentiment, um, anti-sentimental comedy, She Stoops to Conquer. She Stoops to Conquer can be seen then as both an anti-sentimental comedy and a comedy of manners. Now, the play was first performed in 1773. It has abiding value of course because of the emotions that are there but also because of the unity of action, the unity of place and the unity of time which we see within the text. Now, the unity of action, one main plot, there is the wealthy Mr. Hardcastle who has a daughter Kate who is young, who is pretty, who is a good girl and who is in completely under the control of her father. He hopes that she will marry his the son of his friend, Samalo, 
and that son is called Charles Marlowe. Now the problem is that Charles Marlowe is more comfortable with the working class woman rather than an upper class woman and he's afraid of upper class women and so he is unsure as to how to speak to Kate Hardcastle. This is the primary plot line of the play. So what Kate Hardcastle does is she pretends to be a lower class working woman working in an inn so that then he gets comfortable with her, they fall in love and so on and so forth, the marriage becomes possible. That's the main plot line of She Stoops to Conquer. Now, it is in one sense in the tradition of the restoration drama, but instead of the kind of immorality and lewd behavior that was visible in restoration drama, here everything is clean and above board. So there are no married people who are then falling in love outside of their marriage or before and so on and so forth. Instead, they are all working towards a happy marriage. You also have another couple in the uh, text and that is Constance and Marlowe's friend. Constance is Kate's friend and Marlowe's friend Hastings who also of course desire to get married and at the end their marriage is enabled as well. So what we see then is a couples who are heading towards marriage in that sense we can think of it as a romantic comedy and yet because of the emphasis on manners and class structures because Marlowe as we have already said is uncertain of how to behave with upper class women he is more comfortable with lower class women therefore then it also becomes a comedy of manners and it becomes a comedy wherein class structures are examined and seen in some detail. The characters include as we have already listed them Marlowe, his father, and uh, Hastings, his friend. Then we have Hardcastle, the father, and his daughter, Kate Hardcastle. Then there is, of course, Constance, who is the ward to Mrs. Hardcastle. And we have Tony Lumpkin, who is stepbrother to Kate Hardcastle, and who is actually instrumental in a lot of the action in the play. He is the one who first directs Marlowe and Hastings to the Hardcastle home and claims that it is an inn. So when they arrive there, they behave with Hardcastle and Kate Hardcastle as if they are an innkeeper and his daughter. And that is what sets the plot in motion. Now, two love stories are of course successfully brought to a happy ending. And this is of course marriage which is in this thing. But we also in the process see a lot of class distinctions. We see how these class distinctions are enforced and how people escape from them, but also that the confusions that they can lead to. Now, polite society is explored in some depth. And what we see is that there is a mismatch between how a person of a certain class perceives himself and other people within that class and how he behaves or she behaves with people of a lower class. Now the title She Stoops to Conquer comes about because Kate Hardcastle who is initially mistaken to be an innkeeper's daughter behaves as such so that she can then make Charles Marlowe comfortable with herself and that they can then have the happy ending. So she instead of portraying herself as an upper class woman, she then portrays herself as somebody from the lower classes just so that they can have a successful love story. It's also important because we see that class is not necessarily inbuilt into a person. You can move your class depending upon, you can move from class to class depending upon where you want to fit in. So Kate Hardcastle, though she belongs to the upper classes, is able to behave like a lower class person and is comfortable playing that role because of what she wants to come out of her playing that role. Therefore then Kate Hardcastle stoops to conquer. She stoops down from her high position in order to conquer Charles Marlowe and to have a happy ending wherein she will then get married to him. Now in addition to she stoops to conquer, we also have another text by Oliver Goldsmith which is considered fairly important not just because of its content but also because of the position it has in the story of the rise of the novel. Now The Vicar of Wakefield is a text that is called a novella, sometimes a novelette and it is praised for of course its moral worth but it's also funny in some senses, it's also extremely sentimental. Now it is 
as the title itself should indicate to us if it's a story of a vicar it is likely to be a solidly christian story so we should be having a lot of sermonizing we should ha be having a lot of preaching happening within the story itself it is also sentimental because it shows us the descent of a man who is prosperous he moves into poverty the kinds of troubles that attack his family and then eventually how he is reinstated in some happiness and everybody in his family also then finds their own happiness now so therefore the sentimental tradition is fully there every this show when we look at the vicar himself moving from happiness and prosperity into dire troubles poverty and where all his family members his daughters and his sons have all some affliction or the other so one son one son's engagement is broken off another one falls in love one daughter falls in love unsuitably and is just ruined as a consequence all of that when we look at that what we are then privileged to see is sentiment at its best and brightest as in everybody is ruled by sentiment everybody is ruled by emotion so there is of course a lot of crying a lot of preaching at each other and so on and so forth so goldsmith taps into the tradition of the sentimental text during this period whether comedy tragedy novella whatever you want to call it but also he does not de let it degrade into sentimentality but he balances it with reason or at least this is what critics say now it has a lot of individual stories which together come back combine and therefore then make the story of the vicar of wakefield now what we have is the vicar and his wife who have grown up children and the life stories of each of these children so we see that life stories of two daughters and one son in some detail it's also interesting because that fall from prosperity to poverty is indicative of the fall of job in the bible so it's supposed to be in one sense a model on the jobian model from the bible where somebody loses his entire riches wealth and then in that situation also he remains true to god and then eventually of course he is brought back and given everything once again interestingly it had a fairly large fan following in india and there have been versions of um, the vicar of wakefield in indian languages as well including in tamil you have a story called pratap mudliyar charitram which is the story of this person told in tamil so it's a version and it, the translations of this are still available in indian languages by reading goldsmith what do we learn or what do we gain one of course is the fact that it's clean humor so you're not going to be treated to the kind of excesses that you would have had when we read say witcherly instead what you have is humor but which is also in, insightful so you learn about other human beings by reading goldsmith but he's also a satirist so he makes a lot of fun of things that he considered peculiar and this we particularly see in something like citizen of the world where he uses the chinese traveler tradition and he mocks english men and women because of that tradition in addition to the text that we have talked about he also wrote histories he wrote letters he had a huge output across many genres and across many forms in english so studying goldsmith is of course always what worthwhile we have looked at some of his works in detail so we've looked at she stoops to conquer and the wicker of wakefield and the deserted village in some detail thank you very much